Now, immediately upon the influx of U.S. troops and the occupation of Afghanistan, the production of opium sprung up to its historical levels and has increased multiple times since then. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com coming to you in a conversation that is being recorded on the 25th of September 2016. We are talking once again to Michelle Chosodovsky, the director of the Center for Research on Globalization at GlobalResearch.ca. And as we sit here at the end of September 2016, approaching October 2016, we are approaching the 15th anniversary of the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan. Now, that occupation is still taking place to this day, which might seem puzzling to those who believe that the Afghan invasion and occupation was triggered by the false flag events of 9-11-2001 and or the supposed need to get rid of the Osama bin Laden CIA boogeyman from that country. Um, But according to the U.S. government, he was killed and thrown in a motion before anyone knew about it five years ago. So what is the possible reason that the uh, NATO forces are still there with up to as many as 8,400 U.S. troops committed to be there at least until the end of the Obama presidency and likely after that point as well? Well, let's talk about this curious case of the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan. And let's let's start by taking a look at the ostensible reason that NATO is there right now, ostensibly It is because of 9-11 and the invocation of Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, which allows for collective self-defense. Tell us more about how that was invoked in the wake of 9-11 and the complete lack of evidence for the invocation of that uh, treaty article. Well, precisely, the, the Article 5 of the Washington Treaty was invoked uh, on September the 12th in the morning at a meeting of the Atlantic Council. And uh, what happened is that NATO essentially um, declared war. It was confirmed subsequently, but it declared war on Afghanistan on the grounds that Afghanistan had attacked America through its support of Al-Qaeda. It was extremely tenuous, but in a bitter irony, Nobody actually questioned the logic of this uh, of this decision, and that included uh, trade unions, NGOs, and so on. Um, the other element, which I think is very crucial, is that you do not prepare a large scale theater war thousands of miles away in less than twenty eight days. That war was prepared before nine eleven. Uh, and consequently, public opinion w- was led to believe that this was a, an act of retribution. Uh, military analysts were mum on the subject. They know the, the logic and the timing of military, of military projects. Now, the third element, I think, which is very important, is that the Afghan government, which the U.S. refers to as the Taliban, Uh, approached the U.S. State Department on two occasions and said, if you want to have bin Laden uh, extradite the United States to U.S. justice, we will consider and we will discuss it. And that that, um, proposal had been turned down by, by the Bush administration on the grounds, to quote George W. Bush, we do not negotiate with terrorists, quote unquote. Um, so that in effect, uh, the Afghan war was already in the pipeline. And I think what is also important is that the Afghan, the war in Afghanistan under the global war on terrorism, which was launched with, with the war in Afghanistan, sets the stage for a series of wars under the same mandate of going after the terrorists. So we have, of course, we have Iraq. Then we have uh, then we have Libya, we have Syria, we have Yemen, uh, we also have Pakistan, the drone war, um, and um, and then we have um, the extension of the global war on terrorism to sub-Saharan Africa, to Southeast Asia. So that that is why, of course, this this uh, 
a historic event of October 7th, 2001, is so, is so cru crucial because it really initiates the roadmap. Um, and it also initiates the narrative of the global war on terrorism and the terrorists who are actually uh, pinpointed as having brought down the, 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 the World Trade Center buildings on 9-11. On to what extent can the invasion launched in 2001 be separated from the recent history of Afghanistan going back to the 1970s and the operations that had taken place there to destabilize that country beforehand? Well, I think we have to we have to look at at it as a continuum, in the same way as uh, we have to look at Iraq from 1991 onwards. Uh, the war in Iraq started in 1991; it didn't start in 2003, and the war in Afghanistan started in 1979. But what we, what we have to look at, I think, is another dimension: is that the post-war uh, regime model of the United States uh, emerged with Afghanistan. Afghanistan was an advanced secular society, uh, comparable to Syria in many regards, uh, uh, with a uh, highly educated population, women's rights, public sector, uh, social programs, and so on. And what these successive wars, U.S. instigated wars from 1979, of course, that was the war, not against the terrorists, but with the terrorists, because Al-Qaeda was actually used to, uh, as the foot soldiers of, of the United States in, uh, in toppling a secular government. So that we, in a sense, we have sort of the blueprint, the Afghan blueprint of the late 70s is now being applied to Syria, um, the toppling of a secular government and the... Un the lying objective is to replace it by uh, a, an Islamic state, a Salafist uh, principality, which is in fact even confirmed by, by uh, Department of Defense documents. So let's examine the, the logic of this today. Uh, certainly Afghanistan did launch the war of terror and did provide that roadmap, but what is its in, what is it the imperative for being uh, for having troops located in Afghanistan today? Is there a geostrategic and or resource based imperative for control of Afghanistan? I think Afghanistan at the time in 1979 was within the zone of influence of the Soviet Union. And today, Afghanistan is still within that space of, of Central Asia, where, of course, where Russia has, has an enormous amount of influence. But, um, but ultimately, if you look at it from the, uh, from the economic standpoint, there's several things which are crucial. One, it's used as a bridge to transport oil and gas from, uh, you know, from Central Asia. That was the initial um, pretext, in effect, was the Trans-Afghan Pipeline. But there are other considerations. There's their oil resources. Of course, the oil countries, which are in proximity of, of, uh, of Afghanistan. But there's also very um, large um, supplies of lithium, which are used to make batteries, which has become in recent years a very significant um, raw material, uh, strategic raw material. But then I think foremost is that Afghanistan today produces over 90% of the world supply of heroin. And the invasion of Afghanistan occurred at a moment when the Afghan government, together with the United Nations, had implemented a far-reaching drug eradication program. In other words, they were eliminating opium and, and implementing crop, rotation, uh, crop substitution with the support of the UN. They were congratulated by, in the United Nations General Assembly in um, fall of 2001. And in fact, what the Taliban government achieved was a 90, more than 90% collapse in 
opium production uh, recorded in, in, let's say, in 2001. Now, immediately upon the influx of U.S. troops and the occupation of Afghanistan, the production of opium sprung up to its historical levels and has increased multiple times since then. Um, so that, in effect, if we look at if we look at the logic of a multi-billion-dollar industry, which is which is a trade in heroin, um, Afghanistan was absolutely strategic, and we know that both the CIA as well as the U.S. military are complicit in uh, in the trade of op- of uh, of opium and heroin out of Afghanistan to the Western markets. As I say, we know that President Obama has committed troops there, uh, nearly 10,000 of them, until the at least the end of his presidency. Is there any indication that the United States is at all interested in actually bringing troops home or withdrawing presence from Afghanistan in the next presidency? Well, the only scenario that I see is that they take, they take the troops out from one country and they put them back in another country if they're short of troops. And that they do consistently. But I think that they will want to maintain um, um, a military presence in Afghanistan because there's a very significant resistance movement against, uh, against U.S. military occupation. And it might be labeled the Taliban, but the, maybe the Taliban now is the resistance movement. And it comes from various sectors of society. It's not necessarily uh, tied into the Islamic project by any means. Uh, and, uh, and there you have a country which is asserting its national sovereignty. Uh, and, uh, and, and that is the kind of situation which the United States doesn't like. And they're going to keep their troops there if they, if they need them to, to squash that, that resistance movement. Well, are there any resources that you could direct people to on the subject of Afghanistan and the the, the ongoing occupation? Uh, there has been a lot published on Afghanistan. We've been covering Afghanistan from the very outset in 2001, both looking at the military dimensions as well as economic and social dimensions. We've also looked at the history of, of Afghanistan focusing on, on the fact that it was a secular society. And if you look at pictures of the, 19, of the 1970s and 80s, you'll see that, that um, you know, people are very westernized. Uh, you see the U- university campus with the girls, uh, more or less, uh, very stylish, etc. And then you say, well, that, is that the society which the United States destroyed? You know, a society which is modern, where people are educated and so on and so forth, and they've replaced it with the, with the images that we get on, on TV, which are, which are a country which is destroyed, its infrastructure is, is demolished uh, through, uh, through uh, wear and tear and so on and so forth. Um, global research has has a collection of articles under a dossier, uh, Afghanistan and its special reports with several thousand articles which can be consulted uh, by readers. And of course, we will be covering um, the, the commemoration of this um, 15th year of occupation by US forces of a sovereign country in Central Asia. Well, I'm sure I echo the sentiments of the listeners out there in saying that I look forward to that coverage, although it is, of course, not a happy thing to be covering. But it is important to understand this issue and the ongoing occupation and the the real geostrategic imperatives that are behind it so that we can hopefully divert that agenda in the future. Michelle Chosodowski, thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. The Corbett Report is brought to you by the 2010 Video Archive DVD. Buy your copy today at corbettreport.com.